What I want to talk to you about tonight in English is the rise of something that many of you may not have heard of, which is the intelligent community movement worldwide. How many of you have you heard of the intelligent community movement? Just you can raise your hands. One gentleman who helped found it, a couple in the back, and somebody there who wants to pretend they're intelligent. <laughs> you look very smart, by the way. But it is a rising tide among cities around the world. And what I want to do tonight is to tell you a little bit about it and what's happening around the world, because that's my job, to go out and to observe it. We started the intelligent community movement. But more importantly, I want to tell you how you can go home and make your community, your region, your city, wherever you call home, better, more intelligent. Now, I didn't say smart, because you all look very smart to me. But we're talking about going to the next level. We're talking about going to intelligent. So let's, let's go backwards. Okay. We have a lot of fun at what we do because we go around the world, we meet great mayors, great counselors, great people, great entrepreneurs, and we see cities being transformed left and right through innovation. But this, I'm going to take you up about 23,000 feet. I was in the satellite industry. I had a business in the satellite industry. And this is an actual photograph of the Korean Peninsula at night taken with a, a geostationary, geosynchronous satellite. So, which you won't see, of course, are the words North and South Korea there. Okay. That doesn't show up. But check this out. What do you notice right away? In the South, you notice a lot of lights, right? Well, that's South Korea. That's a nation that has moved toward intelligence, right? We all know the South Korean story. They were once the seventh poorest nation on earth in 1974. Now they are the eighth richest, and it wasn't an accident. They decided to take some of the principles of technology, intelligence, education, all the things that we know about, and activate their cities. So if you go to Seoul, if you go to the Gangnam Do Gu district, if you go to Suwon, you will see places very, very robust, thriving. They are themselves, and they are exporting themselves culturally around the world. Everything from, obviously, technology cause to many of the phones you have in your hand, but also culturally. K-pop. Anybody listen to K-pop? It's terrific. <laughs> you know, I'm probably too old, but I listen to it all the time. Why? Because it's a great cultural export that they put on a new railroad and bring out to the world. It's a six billion dollar industry. Okay, go to the north. Go north of the 38th parallel. What do you see? Right, darkness. You see a place plunged into darkness and moving into an even darker space. That's a nation that has made a decision to go the wrong way. People always ask me, what's that little light there? And I always say it's a nor South Korean who lost his GPS system. But the deal is this. It's a perfect analogy for a couple of things. The first one is the stakes are very high for the places you live today, whether it's Rio, whether it's New York, where I come from, whether it's a small community uh, in Canada like Stratford, some of the intelligent cities, because we have a choice. We are going to move toward light with our communities, or we are going to get plunged into the darkness. And I'll tell you why the stakes are very high. Because national governments aren't working. They are increasingly dysfunctional. You don't need to go too far away from Brazil to figure that out. But you don't need to go too far away from Washington to figure it out either. And the reason is not that these places are run by bad people. It's that the problems have become too complex. You know, Henry Kissinger himself in 2011 said, the nation state, as it was designed in Europe about 160 years ago, is increasingly dysfunctional. The problems are too complex to be managed and thought through by central governments, far, far removed from the places that people call home. 
I noticed this months after Kissinger made his speech in New York, which I attended, in 2011, I flew. I was invited to fly to Egypt, to Cairo, to give a speech to a group of young CEOs in a place called Smart Village Cairo. I happened to arrive there on the night that Tahrir Square blew up. And my hotel was looking over Tahrir Square. It was a very, very revealing night for me in terms of the intelligent community movement because what I saw were people who were asking their country to work for them and it was not. They were asking their city to work for them and it was not. And this was something that was being played over and over and over around the world. Egypt was losing its best and brightest. There was brain drain instead of brain gain, which we talk about in our book, Brain Gain. But what was really interesting, I started to hang out with a couple of the young people who worked at the hotels where I was before I actually got evacuated. And every night they would go into that square and they would try to reclaim their city. And they said, if the government doesn't work for us, if this community doesn't work for us, we will develop our own community. And what they did, this is a picture actually that was taken, they spray painted this word. Isn't it interesting that of all the slogans they could have chosen, they chose something that would give them a sense of community, right? Facebook, connectivity, community, right? A sense of being together. So the world has been turned upside down by this. And again, what we are seeing are very, very significant problems that national governments can't handle. We were going to have 70% of the world's population living in cities by 2050. We at the Intelligent Community Forum looked at that and we said, are you kidding me? We can't manage the flow that's in our cities now. Why are we depopulating some of the most beautiful places on earth? Some of the places that people prefer to live. People don't want to be economic refugees. If they go to another place to live, it's probably the best way be is because they want to go for adventure, not for economic opportunity. Because that's a zero-sum game. When my grandfather came over from Italy at the turn of the last century, he didn't come over because he didn't like Italy. He came over because there was nothing there for him. They were plunging into darkness. So we looked at this issue, and we looked at it really, really hard. And that's one of the reasons we started the intelligent community movement. I, I grew up in a community that fell apart. But we discovered something. We brought some really, really smart people together. My father always said, if you want to learn anything, don't hang around with stupid people. <laughs> hang around with smart ones. And my mother said, well, that's good. He'll have a lot of friends. <laughs> but we, we started to bring these people together, and we found out something. And I'm gonna, this is gonna, I'm gonna declare this now, I guess, nationwide. We're being broadcast here. It's a secret. The middle of nowhere is no more. The middle of nowhere is no more. Okay, that'll be in the headlines tomorrow. <laughs> Why? Because for the first time in human history, so far as we can tell, two conditions exist that have never ever existed before in the history of our species. What are they? The first one is a human being can live anywhere he or she wants. The second one is that they can be connected to a global economy. Th those two conditions have never existed before. We've asked anthropologists, historians, because we've caucus people. That's what we do at the Intelligent Community Forum. We bring very, very smart people together to think about this stuff. Never existed before. We looked at that. I looked at that from the perspective of the satellite industry where I was from, where I knew that three satellites in orbit could connect the entire Earth with a broadband signal. And I said, we've got ourselves a new ra railroad. Because the only thing you need to link those two things, where a person lives and where he or she connects to the global economy, is that connecting point. Now, that connecting point is usually broadband. It's usually the internet. It's usually some form of connectivity. That's the new railroad. Same proposition as the old railroad, right? The old railroad was if, you, if it ran past your town, you know, whether you lived in PIE or whether you lived in Canada, if it ran through your town, People are laughing at PIE. What happened? <laughs> Doesn't, don't they have a railroad? <laughs> but you could trade with the next town if you put your cargo on it. And that cargo could be lumber, it could be oil, whatever the commodities were that drove the last, the old economy. The new railroad is quite different, but it has the same principles. If you are on that line, if you are connected to it, you can trade. You can put your ideas, your apps, all of those things on it, and not only trade with the next geophysical village or country, but you can trade worldwide. You can trade with Vietnam. You can trade with Canada. You can trade with China. 
That's a great proposition. And the most important part of it is you can stay home and do it. You don't have to leave. Your mother and father want you to stay home, you know. Well, maybe they don't. <laughs> but if you want to stay home and start your business and be the next great company, why not? That's our proposition, and that's what we're seeing. So here's some examples of what's happening today. 35% of the top 100 fastest-growing companies are now located outside of major metro areas. So we've launched something that is called the Fire of the Intelligent Community Movement. We've brought 145 cities together, and we've got them following a basic set of six principles, and they are creating a new DNA for cities. They are completely ignoring federal governments for the most part, and they're saying, we're going to seize our own destiny, we're going to seize the means of our own economy, and we are going to build from who we are, from culturally who we are. And guess what? We're not going to compete. We're not going to compete for business with the people next to us in the region. We're going to work together. We are going to stop competing with others, and we are going to start competing with ourselves because that's how we see the new world working. And places that do it, like Eindhoven and Holland, miracles are happening. They created something called the Triple Helix. It's a new DNA, literally, where they've got the local government, they've got the private sector, and they've got the academic sector, which is very, very important, the intellectual class, because the new factory floor is going to be the university. That's where the knowledge workers are, are being made. They're all now working together to create new types of ecosystems where new companies flourish and continue to grow and where people feel very, very comfortable doing something that's really, really important, which is removing everything they knew, not being attached, and moving toward a new economy to seize their destiny. They are not transforming themselves into the new Silicon Valley. I want to I make that real clear. They are doing it by being themselves, like the Koreans, like the Dutch. They are also doing something that I really think is important. They are using six basic principles to uh, basically transform themselves. R only one of those principles is technology. So when a, an a community wants to become an intelligent community, it does six things well. And again, you can take your notebook out because you're going to go back home and do this. I'm going to give you some homework here. They look at their broadband infrastructure. Do we have an adequate railroad? They look at their knowledge workforce. We've been talking a lot tonight about education. They understand something about the new knowledge workforce. They understand that the primary objective of education today is to unlearn things, to be creative, to be more like Picasso, right? They understand that about the knowledge economy. Third thing is innovation. They look for innovation. They look for it in the private sector where we have it pretty well. Companies like mine start up all the time in the United States. But they also look for it in their local government. Is local government thinking creatively about its interaction with citizens? Are they looking ahead with us? Fourth thing is we call it digital democracy. Are we bringing everybody along? If knowledge is the endless natural resource that doesn't pollute the water or the air, and we know it's going to be the commodity for the new <coughs> economy. Don't we want everybody along on this ride? The least among us? You know, that's not just a moral mandate. That's good economic sense. And that's what these communities do now. The fifth thing is advocacy. Cities are doing, people like you are doing exactly what you should do when governments na at the national level fail. You're falling back on your own. You're becoming tribal. And you can become tribal in a good way and a bad way. And, and I use that word in a good way here. Tribes advocate. They tell their own stories. They create new mythologies for themselves. Or they reinforce their, their direction. And that's what these cities are doing. They're telling their story to themselves in a new way. They say, this is where we're going. We're hopeful now. We're going to go toward the light. We're not going to go toward the dark. Sixth thing they do is they become sustainable. That's a, that's a no-brainer. If, if I'm going to locate in Brazil, if I'm going to move my company, I'm going to come to a place that is sustainable economically and a place that has good clean air, good quality of life, but also intellectually sustainable. Is it a place that over the next three generations will produce a good, robust economy? So that's what these cities are doing. They're taking these six principles of the intelligent community movement, and they're going forward. And we've got 145 of them now that are performing at very, very high levels. The others learn from them. We bring them together, six, seven at a time, and they start sorting through the more complex problems that the national governments can't sort through. 
and it's beginning to transform the national governments in places like Taiwan, for example, where the president, who used to be a mayor, kind of gets it. Okay, I told you that smart is okay. You're all very smart. We're all smart. But becoming an intelligent community is the key. Technology is not really the thing. People get all jazzed up about technology. But this is, a, this is about unleashing human potential, not technology. We don't, I don't need to know why the lights work. I just need to know what happens when those lights are on. What's the exciting stuff we can do when the lights are on, right? That's what we want. Look, there are three ways we can get into the 21st century, OK? You can go in there kicking and screaming. Right? Like a child resisting, or you can wait for your factories to leave, your economy to collapse, and then you can say, well, I guess we've got to make a change. Well, Buddha told us 2,500 years ago, in the second noble truth, that the reason we suffer is because we are attached, we cling. You can't cling to the past. You can't go into that 21st century kicking and screaming. You've got to go in openly. The second way in is you can go in by way of the 12th century. You know, just take a map of the Middle East and you'll see how that's working, right? You see, if you want to go to the 21st century, I don't think you go by way of the 12th. But the third way is you become an intelligent community. You begin to figure out ways to activate your intelligence. You look at what others are doing who have stopped competing with others and have started competing with themselves, and you go for a ride. Now, this is not going to happen overnight. I'm not going to solve this problem in 18 minutes. I've been working on it for 20 years. But you're going to go home, and as an internet generational project, you're going to sort it out so that your kids never have to leave if they don't want to. That's all that this movement is about. My grandfather used to say, non c'è posto migliore pia della mia casa. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. If you remember that, if you remember that one simple phrase. You don't even have to remember that Lou Zaccarella's grandfather said it. But if you remember it, you will always be motivated because at the end of the day, you will only fight for your country so long. Your country is just an abstract thing. But you will fight for your home and your family and the place where you are culturally sustained endlessly. You will never stop because it is the place that you call home. So. I wish you all the luck in the world going back out into your homes and activating them. We have had a revolution. We obviously see it everywhere we go. It's a technology revolution. You've had enough revolutions in South America. We've had enough in the rest of the world. What we want, what we want to activate is the new renaissance. That's where art, technology, money, culture flourish. That's in those places where all done in cities. The old renaissance was city driven. The new renaissance will be too. So good luck. I hope you understood my English. <laughs> Abrigato and God bless you all. Good night. <laughs>